During the development of Infamous, Sucker Punch wanted to create a story about an ordinary citizen becoming a modern-day superhero. While brainstorming ideas for a protagonist, one of the most prominent ideas was to create an athletic, urban character, the first of such concepts going under the codename Talon. During the later stages of conceptualization, iterations of this everyman character, such as Gearwolf and Chance, began to take on more defining characteristics, such as a bike messenger background and character design, as well as prominent use of firearms for combat. These early concepts also seem to lack any obvious semblance of superpowers, hinting at a possible initial intent to create a powerless, street-level vigilante hero. This eventually resulted in the creation of Cole McGrath, a lowly bike messenger from Empire City who gained superpowers after being caught in the middle of a devastating terrorist attack. Being the protagonist of one of my favorite games ever, Cole McGrath is a character I've been very fond of over the years. While many have lambasted the portrayal of the character in their respective reviews of the game, as uninteresting or lacking personality, which may or may not be entirely based on the incredibly gruff voice work of Jason Cottle. Yeah, that's an understatement. I believe Cole McGrath is an excellent example of character writing in both a gaming and superhero medium, being a study of an everyday individual coming to grips with the enormous weight of responsibility and expectations thrust onto him after suddenly gaining superpowers, and the choice of how to use that power. So today I want to take some time to try and talk about why I like Cole so much by giving an analysis of his character, hopefully giving myself a better understanding of the character in the process, as well as offering a new perspective for those who may be unfamiliar with, or even dislike him. Needless to say, this video will assume those watching are at least somewhat familiar with the story of Infamous, and will contain super massive spoilers. So if you haven't already played the games like a scrub, or watched all the cutscenes on YouTube like everyone else, I recommend you do so before watching. Now. With that obligatory disclaimer out of the way, as I've said before, the character of Cole McGrath was created with the mindset of what would happen if an ordinary person had suddenly gained superpowers. He isn't an alien from a far off planet, he isn't the chosen one, his parents weren't secret agents who fought bad guys. He's just your average Joe. According to an interview with Nate Fox, the director of the game, the decision to write and design Cole as a courier was to instill the theme of Cole being counterculture. Through hints and glimpses into his past, his parents seemed to have done everything in their power to ensure he'd live a successful, model lifestyle, such as putting him into college preparation classes and urging him to pursue a career in teaching. While Cole showed the capability of living up to these expectations, as from all accounts he had no problems academically throughout both high school and college, having read not watched read Dracula, and by his admission was only six credits short of graduating college before dropping out. However, Cole was resentful of the life that his parents had essentially planned out for him, and would often lash out in defiance of the overbearing authority figures in his life. He would constantly find himself in trouble with law enforcement in his youth, which his parents bailed him out of and attempted to sweep under the rug in order to preserve their reputation. Got more information on Lightbulb Man. Before the blast, he had a police record a mile long. Carjacking, assault and battery, armed robbery, you name it. Naturally, his mommy and daddy grease some palms from the charges stuck. But that was then, and this is now. We have our own system of justice, our own set of rules. And mommy and daddy aren't here to save you, poor little Cole. Cole's rebellious streak would continue, especially as he took up a hobby in urban exploration and parkour, which would lead into further run-ins with the police. This eventually resulted in Cole using a college professor's harsh treatment of one of his friends as an excuse to drop out, further noting in Infamous 2's introduction that his main motivation for doing so was to simply spite his parents. Issue 6 of the Infamous comic series depicts Cole walking out on his parents immediately afterward, and presumably hasn't contacted them since if Evil Cole's dialogue with Nyx in Infamous 2 is anything to go by. Any family, Cole? Younger brother? What's up? After what I became? I don't know what we're talking about. Cole has a bit of a chip on his shoulder and isn't too keen about being told what to do. And while it may have seemed like a good idea at the time, now approaching his 30s, it's getting a bit long in the tooth and most of his friends have moved on, with his best friend and his girlfriend being the only ones who stayed by his side in Empire City. Even the career he chose despite those who tried to govern his life for him and make it on his own ultimately relegated him to being little more than a delivery boy, only ever going where and when people tell him. I'm nothing but a damned errand boy, same as before. Going where people tell me, when they tell me, 
I'm starting to think that's never gonna change. No way, man. Once we get that race fear, nobody will say as much as boo to either one of us. He can mark my words on that one. I hope you're right, Zeke. I really do. To put it bluntly, Cole can be considered somewhat of a loser, and even a deadbeat. He's a college dropout, working as a bike courier for a menial wage. His only apparent friend is a fellow social outcast. His family life is in shambles, and he constantly runs away from his problems. He's not exactly what you would consider a model citizen. One of the most relatable aspects about Cole, especially in the first game, to me, is his realistic reactions to the events around him. He's incredibly and understandably pissed at his situation. Two weeks ago, he was just a guy delivering packages, and now he's been framed for one of the biggest tragedies in the world, and trapped in a city full of psychopaths with superpowers who want to kill him. Not to mention his girlfriend hates his guts, believing him to be responsible for the death of her sister who died in the blast. For a majority of Infamous One, the driving force behind most of Cole's actions is more of a selfish desire to protect himself and the people he cares about. He doesn't start out as some heroic figure who takes personal responsibility for the destruction done to the city, nor is he a completely remorseless psychopath who just kills random people for sadistic pleasure. Numerous times throughout the game, Cole states that he isn't doing any of these heroic acts so that people would like him. He was doing them because Moya told him to. This is made even more apparent during the mission's standard protocol, where Cole has to stop the dustmen from launching their boats to get out of the quarantine. When Moya tells him to destroy the boats and release the hostages on board, Cole, regardless of his karmic status, says, I don't want their blood on my hands, Moya, but I really don't see what this has to do with our deal. He doesn't want people to die, especially because of him, but that's more out of a desire to keep his hands clean rather than caring for the people around him and often butts heads with Moya whenever she seemingly tries to waste his time with completely unrelated matters. He isn't even that interested in discovering the truth behind what happened to him, as the only thing that concerns him early in the game is fulfilling his end of the bargain he made with Moya to get himself out of the city. He's simply looking out for himself in a world gone to hell. It's not all that surprising when someone who's been shirking responsibility his whole life refuses to take any. This brings us to the major crux of Cole's development as a character throughout the first game, the choice of how to use the power given to him. Perfectly summed up by a quote from Abraham Lincoln, which serves as a tagline for the game, nearly any man can stand adversity. If you truly wish to test a man's character, give him power. The first of these moral choices is the option to hoard a federal food supply drop for himself and his friends, or to let the starving citizens feed themselves. What's interesting to note about this moment in particular is that no matter what choice Cole makes, neither scene after the fact depicts him as some paragon of morality or a complete bastard. While making this decision, most players will often go straight to blasting one of the civilians to a crisp, but firing a shot into the air is enough to scare the crowd off and net the evil karma choice. So it's entirely possible for evil Cole to not even directly harm anyone in this instance. He doesn't even get that frustrated when Trish tells him off for it me more confused than anything as to why she doesn't understand why he did what he did. What's wrong with you? People are starving and you're stealing the only food they've seen in days? I did it for us. To make sure we're taken care of. I don't get you sometimes. And this sort of blurring of the line between good and evil done with this first choice by making it a choice of either sacrificing your needs for the needs of others or doing what it takes to provide for the people closest to you is very well done in my opinion and sets up the slippery slope of selfish decisions that leads to Cole's eventual downfall on the evil karma path. Throughout the game, Cole is continuously presented with increasingly difficult moral choices, some admittedly more difficult than others. What are those posters supposed to be for? Just trying some out, you know? Spreading word about you? What you're doing? Which one do you like? Hmm. Since this guy is gonna hang those up anyway, I might as well decide how people should view me. Do I want them to love me? Or fear me? Impossible decisions. Many of these are very centered around either putting himself in harm's way or his goal secondary to the needs of the people around him, or choosing to ignore or even exploit them for his convenience. These include taking the brunt of the government quarantine officers alone, or using a riot to draw heat off himself cutting people free about to be lynched and publicly executed by the mob or choosing to simply continue with his mission, or seizing the opportunity to gain a tactical advantage in a fight at the risk of nearby civilians. This most apparently affects his appearance and the nature of his powers, with his electricity not only becoming blue or red in response to the state of his mind, 
but his abilities themselves becoming more accurate and precise to avoid collateral damage, or more erratic and destructive to cause as much damage as possible without regard for anything else. This starts to have a visible change in his behavior during his time in the Warren District. After Alden Tate escapes from custody due to Zeke abandoning his post, Cole has a talk with Trish about the matter. While he's evil, they argue about who the one at fault was due to Cole's track record of fucking everything up, which comes across as more trying to shift blame away from himself more than anything. While on good karma, Cole begins to show genuine concern for his city and its people, stating that he won't be able to save everyone when things start heating up, and obviously being displeased by this. I know he means well, but this is serious business. People are dying and I can't protect everyone. Might be time for Zeke to take a seat on the bench. Most likely brought upon by Zeke's earlier display of uncharacteristic selflessness, as well as the increasing brutality of Alton and the Dustman's actions, helping him to truly see the severity of the situation. Another interesting thing to note is that after Cole's fight with Sasha, the leader of the Reapers, and an old flame to Kessler who, spoilers, is a future version of Cole from an alternate timeline, Cole ponders about how her power over her mind control tower has dramatically affected her mental state, and wonders if the same will happen to him. As he continues down the path of evil, Sasha will communicate telepathically with him, offering up assistance with the Reapers under her control, and giving him comfort and reassurance whenever Trish complains about him being a dickhead. Along with this, his appearance will actually start to mirror that of Sasha's, with his skin becoming a sickly pale white, his clothes becoming caked with what appears to be blood, and the back of his head covered in lightning bolt shaped black markings, which I think is a nice subtle development of Cole becoming exactly what he feared of being, which in itself may serve as foreshadowing for what happens in the sequel, but we'll get to that. Eventually this all comes to a head when Cole faces what Kessler deems as his final test to choose between saving the only remaining doctors and medical professionals left in Empire City, or saving Trish. This is the culmination of all the choices Cole has made throughout the game, and the ultimate lesson that Kessler passes on to his past self, to selfishly sacrifice the needs of others for his own self-interest, or to put his own needs aside for the greater good. Regardless of karma, in the aftermath of Trish's death, Zeke's betrayal, and the revelation that Moya had lied to him from the very beginning, it is here where Cole has hit the lowest point he ever has in the series, and probably his life. With nothing left to lose, he sets his sights on Kessler and the First Sons. Rationalizing with himself that they're the source of all his pain and suffering, he wages a one-man war against the First Sons, eventually tracking down the source of his powers and the catalyst of the quarantine, the race fear. It is here where both versions of Cole have a moment of clarity, an epiphany almost. After destroying the race fear with every ounce of rage and power inside him, Hero Cole finally realizes that the world doesn't revolve around him. It may have felt like it did, but in reality, this whole situation was bigger than him. He understands that his personal desires don't matter, and that keeping the people of Empire City safe is what's really important. While Evil Cole's partial successful attempt to use the race fear to boost his powers opens his eyes in a sense, realizing the power he truly possesses. Despite wanting nothing more than to leave the city before, he sees that the rotting corpse of Empire City is his to control that everyone and everything in it is his for the taking, and that no one in the world has the power to deny him what he wants anymore. Shortly after, Cole has his final confrontation with Kessler at the Racefear Blast site, who reveals himself as a version of Cole from an alternate future with his dying breath, come back to prepare him for the arrival of the Beast, and then dies, leaving his younger self with both his memories of the future and his mission to prevent the destruction of the world. It is after the battle that we see the result of the choices Cole has made on the road to his destiny. With evil karma, having fallen down a path of selfishly looking after only himself, sacrificing countless innocents to aid in his quest for freedom and revenge, and deliberately recreating the same tragedy that started all this suffering to grant himself the power to crush Kessler and anyone else who would stand against him, Cole has become a completely apathetic and remorseless psychopath, perfectly content with ruling over his isolated corner of the world littered with garbage and corpses, continuing to disregard the responsibilities of his powers, even as the beast draws near, and viewing other human beings as nothing more than playthings. He is now no different than the other psychos trapped in the cage that is Empire City, the only difference between them being the power at their disposal, and Cole has ensured that no one will ever be as powerful as him. Ironically, this is probably the best ending for Cole personally within the confines of the first game. As with good karma, Cole acknowledges that despite his best attempts to escape from the circumstances brought on by Kessler and the race fear, he has come to understand that this is now his life that the responsibility of using his powers for the greater good will be his burden until the day he dies. And with the beast soon to come, it may not be a long life. With Trish gone, his friendship with Zeke in shambles, and Moya planning her next move, Cole's situation has never been bleaker, 
and as he himself laments, he has never been more alone. Shortly after the events of the good ending, the infamous tie-in comics pick up to serve as a bridge between the first two games. In this miniseries, we come to learn that Cole's entire sense of self and reality has been completely shattered by the revelation of Kessler's identity, and the fact that he has essentially puppeteered major events in Cole's life to lead him down the path to becoming strong enough to defeat the beast. Zeke attempts to humanize Kessler to put Cole's worries at ease, but this ultimately doesn't seem to do much to satiate him. Cole would then encounter Kessler in a dream, continuing to hammer home the importance of the beast's imminent arrival. Despite Cole's vocal reluctance to accept the task, Kessler insists that Cole must possess both physical power and the strength of will to make the necessary choices to stop him. Towards the finale of the story arc, as Cole and Moya's forces wage a massive battle with a mutant conduit of Kessler's making, Cole has yet another epiphany. Though he wants nothing more than to run away from this fight, he realizes that doing so will only warrant the creature to keep pursuing him until he's dead. He can't run away from this problem, as he's done so many times in the past. Not anymore. He's in too deep. After defeating David once and for all, Cole understands the importance of his role in the world, and starts to make good on his promise on stopping the beast. Cue the beast kicking his ass and destroying the city. Infamous 2 presents an intriguing continuation of Cole's development as a character, both for good and evil karma. Because it continues off the previous game rather than starting from scratch with a completely new protagonist, Cole's in a much different, but just as flexible position at the start of the game. With renewed resolve after picking himself up from his defeat at the hands of the beast, Cole finds new hope in the city of Numeray at the prospect of improving his powers to combat the beast once more. Good Cole starts the story off much more friendly and kind-hearted than his counterpart from previously. Having still gone through the same experiences and lessons that made him a hero in Empire City, he scoffs at the idea of causing fire to a swamp village to take out the militia, and will drop whatever task he's doing to help a mugging victim, even if he's right in front of his objective. He also tends to act more diplomatic during conversations with his allies, often serving as a mediator whenever they butt heads with each other. Evil Cole has seemingly been changed into a less extreme version of his previous incarnation, acting as more of a self-centered anti-hero than the crazed lunatic we left him as previously. However, he still shows the same violent and destructive tendencies and apathy from before. It doesn't bat an eye at sacrificing civilian lives to achieve his goal of attaining more power to settle his score with the beast. The first example of this is when he overloads a generator in a swamp village on the way to Numeray to take out a militia blockade in one swift motion. His conversation with Quill regarding the matter afterward, I believe, lays out the crux of Cole's arc in the second game, and one of the central themes of Infamous 2 as a whole. That is the idea of retaining your own humanity in the pursuit of power. In response to Quo's reprimanding of his callousness and indifference towards the lives of others, Cole snaps at her with an interesting look at how he views himself. Don't forget what it's like to be human. But I'm not human, am I? Not anymore. Oh, you don't understand what it's like. But you're right. I do have powers. And I use them. As he continues down the path of evil he chose in the first game, dehumanizing people as living batteries, ultimately viewing those closest to him as a means to an end, and attempting to use the very weapon of mass destruction that caused the Empire event to gain greater power, Cole starts to see himself no longer as a human being, but as a being of power. He most likely views the mission to defeat the beast as more of a burden than anything, or even as eliminating any competition to his own power, and he will do whatever is necessary to accomplish this, such as ramming a trolley full of explosives into a militia base, potentially killing any innocent prisoners they have inside, or tricking the Numeray rebels into aiding him by posing as militia and slaughtering them by the dozens. Good Cole, having retained his humanity and sense of justice, holds much greater concern for the lives of others. As seen in his showing of restraint in the swamp, refusing to put others at risk, and going out of his way to help those around him. He frees the police to raid the militia stronghold with greater precision and fewer casualties, with the added long-term effect of making the streets of the city safer, and providing the rebels with much-needed medical supplies, even at the risk of gaining nothing from them in return. Having already chosen between good or evil and Infamous 1, Infamous 2 takes those choices and progresses them to their logical endpoints with its final choice. To use the RFI and sacrifice yourself and the few other conduits to save the human race, or to side with the beast to activate latent conduits and usher in the next stage of evolution. To hammer the point of humanity versus power home even more, 
the evil choice is even worded as a betrayal of the human race. Choosing to side with the beast sees Evil Cole ruthlessly hunt down his old friends turned to enemies to destroy the RFI, the only means of killing the beast. As he fights with Nyx throughout the city, she reminisces about the times they spent together bonding over their mutual experiences, sharing their pasts, and she even expresses a similar sentiment regarding fear of being just another face in the crowd that Cole used to. Evil Cole, true to his nature, shrugs off all these attempts to sway him, stating that he has no problem outright murdering the kindred spirit he's come to know. You gotta kill me, Cole. You can live with that. I think I'll live. Damn it, demon! While she may have proven useful before, and provided them with some decent company, at the end of the day, Cole is only interested in his own goals, and won't let anyone stand in its way, no matter who they are. Dealing the final blow to Nyx, Cole finally faces off with the only person left to stand in his way, Zeke, his lifelong best friend, who has been with him through thick and thin, for better or worse, and proven himself an invaluable help in his desire to redeem himself in Cole's eyes. A normal human with nothing but a six-shooter, standing against one of the most powerful beings on the planet, it's no surprise how this is often regarded as the best story moment in the game. In killing Zeke, essentially the only connection he has left to his past life, Cole fully embraces his new identity as a pure-blooded conduit, and destroys the last hope for all mankind in a fit of anger. Ironically, the Beast, despite his newfound power, still holds the conscience of the man who was once John White. Unable to continue with his mission of saving conduit kind from the plague by wiping out humanity, he passes his power on to Cole, in a similar manner to how Kessler had passed his memory to him in Empire. With him and his new ever-growing army of conduits bidding farewell to their old human lives, Cole marches forward to bring a new age of life on Earth, who was once an insignificant bike messenger from Empire City, is now the most powerful conduit in the world. This is essentially the original evil ending on a much greater scale. Cole is now the very thing Kessler sought to prevent, the beast, the king of the new world, and no one is stronger than him. The good ending sees Cole make the ultimate sacrifice to fulfill his destiny of preventing the beast and the plague from destroying mankind, using the power of the RFI to wipe them both from the face of the earth at the cost of himself and several thousand conduits around the world. In direct juxtaposition to Evil Cole's ruthless disregard for his friends and the people of Numeray, Good Cole gives a heartfelt goodbye to Zeke beforehand, knowing it may be the last time he ever sees him. He initially refuses to leave behind LaRoche and his rebels as they try to stall the beast, and is visibly distraught over Nick sacrificing herself to do the same, even after all their fights and disagreements before. As he makes his final run to charge the RFI, even the remaining militia lay down covering fire and cheer him on in the face of a dire crisis such as this. After charging the RFI and letting himself have one final victory by bringing the beast to his knees, Quo returns urging him to press the button, saying that he made the right choice before, the choice she admits to being too scared to make. Cole reassures her in their final moments, saying that he's scared too, and activates the RFI, ending the threat of the beast for good. To contrast the original good ending, with Cole uncertain that the people's love for him will last, Unable to trust anyone after all the betrayals he had experienced, the city that Cole defended erects a memorial in his honor, vowing to never forget all that he had done for them. And as Zeke takes his body out to sea, he contemplates about how often he hears people talk about conduits and humans as if they're completely different, but dismisses it. Because in the end, there was no one with more humanity than Cole McGrath. I love you, brother. And I'm sure gonna miss you. Cole McGrath is one of my favorite characters, from one of my favorite games ever. While this video is in no way an objective analysis of the character, as I have no way of really knowing what the writer's intentions were, this is just my takeaway from his story, and why I've grown so fond of him playing through these games dozens of times throughout the years. If you disagree with my views in this video, that's fine. I'd like to hear what other fans of the series have to say about the matter. But anyway, thanks for watching. This was a video I've been wanting to make for a really long time and the process of writing it was a really fun exercise. I hope to make more stuff like this soon, so in the meantime, I'll see you guys later. Bye bye.